So colleagues, thank you so much for joining us after the coffee break and for being here for the exciting end of this session on uh, the advancing nature-based solutions in humanitarian action. So I understand you had a very interactive morning. We're now going to be discussing with our panelists and bringing a slightly different perspectives from the donor community, from research, from NGOs on what does this actually mean? What does it look like? What are some of the lessons learned we already have? And in particular, how to chart our way forward. Um, we wanted to first start with a bit of a reflection on where are we at this year, what has happened since the NBS in humanitarian contexts first became a very strong topic and the sphere guidelines on NBS were put out. Um, and just thinking about key events, key findings, what are some of the things that have happened this year? And I think I'll start with that and I'll introduce a panelist after. I don't know, Veronica, would you like to get started with a few thoughts from your side? So we need to put on the microphone. Again, uh, so my name is Veronica Ruiz. I'm the program manager for resilience for IUCN. So uh, I have to say, IUCN, we embark in this uh, journey together with IFRC, Sphere, and all the many colleagues here in the room. And since then, many things have happened. But particularly this last year, from 2023 to 2024 that we are right now, many things have happened. It was it has been a really a catalytic uh, push. Uh, I can start talking about more at the policy level, and I have co colleagues here in the panel will also talk about and to see how the importance of coming together in this uh, joint narrative. And uh, one of the key uh, milestones was the joint statement on climate, nature and people uh, last year at COP28, which was the first time as well to have a dedicated day on relief, recovery and health. Uh, this was like a real, a real change, but also moving into how to integrate nature in uh, armed conflict. Uh, Marie, she will be talking more about this. Uh, and also I have to talk about that how we come together to make a uh, catalytic change. So IUCN, we set up together with uh, the Secretariat for the COP27, so with EGIT. This is the first time an initiative is being uh, um, put in place together with a COP presidency, and this is for enhancing nature-based solutions for accelerated climate transformation. This is not only about the conservation community coming together, but how we bring all the different communities working on climate action in moving forward on this. Um, particularly very important also moving into uh, other uh, partnerships and network. We have the HEHAN. Yesterday we have, and I did mention in the previous session, we have yesterday our annual meeting. Uh, and we say with Erica, I think it was only one, organi two organizations working on environment back in 2016. Yesterday, Nature Based Solutions was a dedicated cross cutting theme. So I think these are some of the uh, achievements in the past year. And I think, um, uh, Nini, you can uh, um, build on it. Thanks, Veronica. And indeed, I realize I forgot to introduce myself. So I'm Nicola Newman. I lead the Climate and Environment Program at the IFRC here in Geneva. Um, and indeed, I think one of the key partnerships, it's partnerships is really at the basis of all this work. And I think that's really been about breaking silos, bringing stakeholders together. A couple of the things I'd like to highlight and something which we were just discussing with Erica as well includes the Climate and Environment Charter for humanitarian organizations, which has been around now for a couple of years, but now has over 400 signatories. And only um, last week, we now have an established small but existing secretariat enabled by USAID and ECHO support, which is really about how do we bring the whole humanitarian sector together on climate and environmental action? How do we make that happen? How do we turn political commitments into concrete targets and plans within our national societies uh, for the Red Cross, within humanitarian organizations in the field in all regions. And we also have government supporters, such for US, um, part of that. So that's been a big shift for us in the, in the humanitarian world. There's also an aid donors declaration, uh, which took place, and Erica can tell us more about that. So we've really seen this momentum grow and grow. And I would say that the last year has seen a shift from talk towards more action and more concrete projects more concrete experiences um, that we will be unpacking throughout the panel as well. 
Um, so I think with that, without further ado, we'll move to the panel. Um, the panel consists, as I mentioned, different types of stakeholders we have with us. I have here on my right, Marie. Um, Marie Schellens, who's the Environment, Peace and Security Advisor at PAX, um, and they've been working on an interesting catalogue of NBS initiatives and trying to look at what could that mean for different actors, and in particular in conflict-affected areas um, and conflict-sensitive nature-based solutions. So very keen to hear from you. On my right, I've got Erica Claresi, who is the lead at USAID on the, in the Bureau on Environmental Bureau for Humanitarian Aid, Environmental of, climate. Environment and Climate Affairs. Um, yes, exactly. The Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance uh, and leads the environment and, and climate integration work there. Um, and she brings more than 30 years experience um, working at the humanitarian level, but in particular looking at how do we bring environment together? How do we bring climate together? And really you've been there to live through this evolution of how these concepts and approaches um, have, have moved across time. Online, we have Axel um, Schmidt, who I believe you already saw this morning. He's the Emergency Response and Training Coordinator at ASB. Um, and they have been already working on pioneering a project in 14 countries, um, in particular around WASH and the humanitarian sector, bringing in nature-based solutions, including looking at the relevance of, of the sphere guide. Um, and then we have Mana Farugi, who's the Climate and Environment Advisor for the FCDO in the Sahel region. Um, and obviously, as we all know, Sah the Sahel region is one of the most conflict prone, one of the most climate sensitive areas in the world. And FCDO has been working there for over two decades. So very keen to hear from you. What do these climate and environment issues matter or mean in that type of context? And, and what's the FCDO experience? And then, of course, we have the lovely Veronica Ruiz, who's leading the climate and NBS work at the, IFR, at the IUCN uh, here in Switzerland, in Glo, uh, and has been really one of the main minds behind this NBS sphere guide. So since, as I mentioned, the sphere guide is one of the things we want to be looking at today, I'll maybe pass to you, Axel, and also to bring our online colleagues into the discussion from the beginning. Could you tell us a little bit more how have you worked on that guide in the last year? How has it influenced this, your work? Um, and what have been some of the lessons learned you've had um, in unpacking what does NBS mean in humanitarian contexts? Over to you. Thank you and everybody. Um, hello online and hello in Geneva. I hope you're having a good time. Um, lessons learned that's a very early stage because um, I'm the outsider, also a sphere focal point and sphere trainer, emergency response coordinator to support a large program with many wonderful partners in 14 countries. And um, the good thing is we can use some synergies because we all believe in this nothing about us without us slogan, which is used by um, organizations of persons with disabilities, what we believe we can use it for everything and really uh, not only looking carefully at uh, the environment, so nothing about us in the sense of environment, but also in the sense of people. And um, now we are in the designing phase of how we can link, learn and connect in those 14 countries, how we can uh, get the knowledge of the partners and especially get the knowledge of uh, the people. Because um, very often we hear that we have to facilitate, bring projects for people, uh, but we all know they are just working with people. And I think it's very important that we create the space that people can also give us solutions, that we are not only talking, but also listening, and that we at head offices not always have uh, the solutions. Like right now, I'm sitting in front of a beautiful um, tree in Bonn, and certainly I don't know the context and the situation on the ground. So the idea that we are having is we want to use Sphere and the Sphere Handbook, especially with the foundation chapters, uh, especially the humanitarian charter with a rights-based approach, with the experience 25 years plus of Sphere, but also all the evidence that is in there to use Sphere as our foundation, but also as our common language. So we don't need to discuss things from scratch again. And um, 
yeah, that we also create that mindset um, among partners that people uh, are the solutions. And it's great how we can combine uh, the nature-based solution guide with the Sphere Handbook. And actually now I'm head of this guy at the moment myself, by heart, a field person, but I would like to give uh, the word for a few minutes to my colleague and also my uh, mentor when it comes to inclusion, Mas Anang, uh, who I just asked to say a few words from the perspective of Indonesia. Mas Anang, to you. Ah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Patsel. Hello, everybody. I'm Anang uh, from Indonesia, and uh, I live in a village in Yogyakarta uh, region in Indonesia. So uh, related to the nature-based solution, this is my perspective. Uh, so uh, the nature-based solution, uh, we have a new abbreviation right now, NBS. <laughs> I've been living in, in society for a long time, actually. Uh, because in my village, there are some uh, uh, positive uh, 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 knowledge and also uh, practicing some culture related to the nature based uh, solution for uh, water, for the waste, including uh, to uh, minimize the, the waste uh, uh, at the time. Uh, so, uh, in my opinion, the nature based solution have been living in society uh, for a long time. But however, the, the speed of the industry and technology often exceeds and override the positive habit and culture of the local community that have uh, knowledge and strong uh, related nature based solution. For example, when I was uh, a kid uh, 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 at my school, uh, all of the food served by the rabbit in banana leaf, but right now, uh, the school puppy uh, eat food wrapped in plastic. So this is make uh, some challenging uh, situation uh, to managing the, the waste. But uh, again, uh, referring to the uh, uh, foundation of the uh, one of the uh, core belief in the sphere and in line with the core humanitarian standard uh, where community are the center of humanitarian action that does not uh, worsen uh, their situation. So the nature-based solution approach is very important to take into account uh, the community knowledge and skill, including their simple thing uh, related to the nature-based solution because uh, I believe that simple and local is the best technology and enable uh, sustainability. So this is my uh, uh, perspective. But the good thing, I also uh, learned about the new abbreviation right now, NBS is nature-based solution. Thank you, Pa Axel. Thank you, Masanang. And I think I want to leave it like that. And just as a general approach, we also want to make it easy to find um, nature-based solutions. And we want, also want to make it personal. So it's always easy <clears throat> sorry, to, uh, to hide behind um, others and waiting for other solutions, but we all have power uh, to make a change and uh, we wanna create that space for that. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks so much, uh, Axel and, and Masana. I think that was a really great way to get us started and really honing in on these things. Keep it simple, local and easy. Um, and I loved that we got that reflection from Masana on, okay, this is something we've been doing for a long time. Now it has a new term. Um, and, and there's different elements in it um, on how we look at nature, whether we're looking at how we manage it, reduce pressures on nature, and how do we use it as a solution, and indeed that many of these solutions already exist uh, and come uh, locally and should be locally led. Um, I'd maybe pass over to you, Erica, and to hear a little bit on your reflections on that. How do you feel um, hearing to these reflections, and what are your thoughts on Okay, now we're talking about nature-based solutions and moving towards nature-based solutions in humanitarian contexts. What does that mean from a USAID BHA perspective? What's come before? Where are we now? What's maybe new or is it not new? And what do you think are the top priorities we should be focusing on? 
With with many thanks, Nini. I appreciate this um, opportunity, and it's just a delight uh, delight to be here with you all online, as well as those of you who are in the room. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here. And yes, thank you so much to Veronica for inviting me to this panel. Um, so first and foremost, I think I do want to start with USAID's climate strategy. Um, so um, I've I've had the privilege of working with USAID for for twenty years, and I've been involved in both the development of USA's climate strategies uh, during the previous Obama administration, as well as the current Biden-Harris administration. And so this climate strategy takes us through 2030, and a key component of that strategy is really has the humanitarian perspective embedded into it. We as humanitarians were very active. It was an extremely dynamic process to develop this strategy. Um, we had, you know, consulted with external stakeholders, internal engagement, frankly, um, much more engagement in this second strategy than there was in the first. Um, and to that end, we as humanitarians worked with uh, environment colleagues of ours and climate colleagues across the agency to really keep the focus of our strategy at the highest level on equitable and ambitious action. We recognize that we will not be successful if we only focus on narrowly on ambition. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions can and will put people in harm's way. If people can be displaced from their land, uh, we can have, uh, we, we really brought that humanitarian putting people first. If we're not looking at critical populations and the knowledge and the expertise that they bring to the solutions. So that was really a critical component where, you know, I have a, an environmental and engineering and kind of sciences background around myself. I'm not an expert. I'm, a, as I'd like to say, a quote-unquote dumb physical scientist, but I have learned <laughs> from my, from my uh, social scientist colleagues, my democracy governance, really this piece on the just transition and how we bring people to the table. Um, and absolutely, this work um, on that piece on equity was informed uh, by the racial reckoning in 2020 across the United States, certainly uh, ev as evidenced by the murder of George Floyd. This really to had us look as, as an agency, as a sector, looking across our sector at the importance of bringing all voices to the table. And at the end of the day, again, these are humanitarian principles. We put people first. And so I appreciate um, my, my German uh, colleagues' uh, reference to the nothing about us without us. My persons with disabilities colleagues are going further to simply say nothing without us, right? Because good solutions come from all angles. And so these indeed are humanitarian perspectives. If we go forward with work that doesn't put people at the center, people will be harmed. We've seen this with sugarcane plantations. It's simply, simply part of what we can see. And so from a humanitarian perspective, BHA, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, some of you may have known us for years as Food for Peace and the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, or as OFTA, in 2020, we came together. And in doing so, we have a, a tremendous focus on climate and environmental action. Absolutely, the Climate Charter was a game changer. Um, we were quite inspired uh, to be the second donor to sign on to the Climate and Environmental Humanitarian Charter. We see a tremendous amount of opportunity coming out of this uh, out of that piece. But I want to just come back to BHA again. We have a specific uh, Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance Climate Action Plan. All of our donor, all of our offices, all of our missions across the seat, across the world, we have over 100 USAID missions. So we have that large uh, presence overseas. All of our, uh, all of these different operational units have developed climate action plans. We have specific targets. As some of you may have seen, we put out uh, a climate uh, proposal, a climate solicitation called our Climate Smart and Disaster Disaster Ready annual program statement. That opportunity is now closed, but we're using our humanitarian dollars for discrete uh, climate adaptation programs. But in addition to, if you will, those kind of standalone programs, my role within the agency is really on environmental integration within the humanitarian settings. So I have a regulatory authority position looking at, and my title is a Bureau Environmental Officer. I'm a climate integration lead. And so it's all about integration. And what I really loved about seeing these NBS presentations is that we don't always call it nature-based solutions, right? We call it, it's a livelihoods program. We know that our colleagues across the world have been doing this for many years. And to that end, when we're asking the question of, oh, can we spend humanitarian dollars mm -hmm. on this work? If it has a clear humanitarian objective, and if it makes absolute sense, 
And this is simply just the way of doing it, climate smart agriculture, cleaner, uh, cleaner production, waste minimization. These are things that just make sense. I like to kind of frame it perhaps over overly simply, but I think simple, simple is quite good. As my, my colleague Masan said, simple and local uh, is, is often best, but you know, we want cleaner, safer spaces for everyone. I mean, really that's kind of what it what it comes down to. And so from that humanitarian perspective, we're also in the midst of something we're calling the a program life cycle redesign process. As you can imagine, we brought these two massive food and non-food uh, uh, humanitarian offices together. We have work to do to, to improve efficiencies. The localization piece is really at the center of our climate strategy vis-a-vis -vis that equity piece. Um, we're going to be reducing inefficiencies, reducing redundancies, reducing the barrier to entry to be able to access USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance Funds. And so that's really a, a, a critical piece that I want to share when we're talking about this program redesign process. We're focused on localization. We're focused on climate positive humanitarian assistance. We're focused on anticipatory action. And finally, I want to just wrap up with, again, in, in the space, um, our, our gratitude towards IFRC, ICRC, and now with ICFA for managing the climate and environment. Thank you to all that made sure the environment was included within this climate charter. That's absolutely essential because the earth doesn't care. Uh, if, if you call it climate or environment, it's all uh, it's all the same in its unique uh, it's individual diversity. But we also, um, I've been very privileged to work uh, with my colleague, uh, Carolina Kolonowska from ECHO to, uh, we hosted uh, the, the, the first ever in person, we've had virtual events. Uh, we, I think this was our fifth total event, but bringing together donors on the greening of humanitarian assistance. And so we had a meeting, uh, we were privileged to, to spend time in Brussels in January um, and I I guess it was six of us donors came together. It was uh, it was it was the U.S. It was the EU. It was Spain. It was Canada. It was Germany, um, and it was of course the Swiss and and France had had a certain level of engagement as well. But they had other items they had to be attention drawing attention to. But suffice it to say that we as donors know that we have to do our part to look at better aligning our policies. We came away from this. Uh, it was a three day, two and a half day meeting, something along those lines, recognizing that we. We are more alike than we are unalike, and we can absolutely get to spaces. And I would love, and I've been having a fabulous time this week talking to all of you expertise and say, I really feel that we need to have something akin to a greening of humanitarian assistance standard or a principle, something that we can all draw to. And frankly, we're nearly there. I wouldn't even think about <laughs> such a thing if we didn't have the climate charter, if we didn't have the donor declaration against the climate charter. I could go on and on and on in this space. And now I, I wanted to yield time to others, but, but thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight and I really appreciate being here and, and listening and learning from you all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eric, and really great to, to hear those different elements. And you raised so much adding these elements of equity, just transition, the importance of have, having strategies and policies and a joint vision in place, but really applying that in practice. And also why this does matter for humanitarians. And I really like how you coined that. As long as the humanitarian principle is there, it is humanitarian action and climate and environment is more and more um, something that, that has to be addressed and not something that is, is nice to nice to have, but a must have. Um, maybe building on that thought, Marie, it would be interesting to hear from you on the work you've started already. What do you think needs to change? So we're hearing that there is more and more donor support and interest in this area of work. What does that look like in practice? What do we need to adjust or change in, in our existing work, in our policies, regulations, to actually be able to scale nature-based solutions, in particular in fragile and conflict-affected um, states? Thank you so much. Um, so, um, first of all, I would like to give a small introduction to some work that we have been doing recently, which is uh, the uh, catalog of nature-based solutions for peace and security. So we have been, um, I, I work for PAX, which is a peace building organization that partly, um, that partly um, works in the humanitarian space, but also just in the, in the broader regions of like from conflict prevention, prevention through the whole peace building part. Um, and I just wanted to mention that we we have started to create this this um, 
nature-based solutions catalog because we kind of saw a gap in, in if, well, nature-based solutions is like a huge topic being talked about, but often not in a conflict sensitive way. And that's why you get a lot of divestment away, a lot of risk averse donors that might be interested in nature-based mm. solutions will actually not, uh, not risk going into those mm. communities that actually are the most vulnerable of them all. Mm. Um, so we're working very hard to kind of create this catalog, this inventory of existing nature-based mm. solutions that also like actively contribute and um, uh, with a with a very like um, that are aware that they also as an ob as an ob objective of their nature based solutions want to contribute to peace as well in the same time and I I do know that uh, in the humanitarian context and in in the kind of like uh, cycle of response that you have in 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 disaster events that's definitely a problem within the protect protected uh, crisis part when when maybe like. Uh, yeah, violence and, and disagreements between different groups uh, comes up a lot. And there are a lot of opportunities. There is also within the environmental peace building um, community, a lot of uh, knowledge, a lot of opportunities being pushed for around environmental peace building. So using the environment to contribute to peace, but there are quite little practical cases known yeah. actually. And so that's why we really want to rally all the information that exists already, we want to rally all of the um, the projects that are being done on a local level uh, and kind of like showcase them, learn from them, what are the challenges that they're facing, what are the opportunities that are really there, what is working well and how do we actually um, learn from that, how can we scale that up. Um, so yeah, that's mainly the work that we're involved in. Um, then uh, like your question about what needs to yeah. what needs to happen, kind of these, these lessons learned from these uh, from these um, um, experiences they they should not go lost they should be known there should be guidelines should be based on them I really like the sphere guidelines they're so clear but they don't really include any not, not much yet on conflict sensitivity so we also need to learn from these most vulnerable situations like how do we actually deal with them um, so I think there's still some work to be done definitely on social inclusion on uh, yeah on conflict sensitivity mm. in this field. Mm. Great, thank you so much, Marie, and and um, I really encourage everyone to look into this emerging work that seems extremely interesting and and the diverse types of experiences, even if a small pool, but the diverse geographies and contexts and experiences. Maybe building on that, it would be interesting to hear from you, Mana. I'm just checking that we still have you online because I can only see Axel's. Yes, perfect. Um, I would love to hear from you a little bit. Do you have experiences, first of all, obviously, how the FCDO is approaching this whole topic of climate environment, but in particular also nature-based solutions and looking at, at um, conflict sensitivity, fragile contexts, understanding um, you know, your take on that, but also if there's any practical examples or regional initiatives you might have been involved in in the, in the Sahel in particular or elsewhere that you would be able to, to share with us and give a bit more of a flavor. What does this look like in practice? Sure, thank you so much, um, Ini. And, um, and just to say uh, thanks a lot for Veronica for inviting me to join this panel on behalf of the, the UK government. Um, so my name is Manaim, I'm the Regional Climate and Environment Advisor for FCD in the Sahel. So I cover um, five Sahel countries from Mauritania to Chad. Um, and my role as a, as a regional advisor is to identify ways in which the UK can contribute to climate adaptation and resilience, uh, both through our ODA portfolio and through our diplomatic engagement in Sahel countries. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion so far, and I'm really excited to be part of the conversation because this topic of nature-based solutions in humanitarian context is an area of increasing interest for um, FCDO. But I have to say it's very humbling um, hearing about the, the tremendous work that has been done by partners uh, to date in the field and by other donors who, who have very um, ambitious strategies in place. Um, for FCDO, this is still very much an emerging area of work. And um, I have to say very much country-led. And I think my interpretation of this is because there is still um, often a perceived dichotomy between humanitarian and, and sort of nature and climate objectives. Um, many people, uh, including in, in our institutions, see, still see humanitarian assistance as sort of focused on responding to people's immediate needs uh, and on uh, its life-saving mission, while um, climate and nature approaches are often seen as more suited to stable contexts. Um, so nature-based solutions in humanitarian context is not necessarily a sort of intuitive association from a, a policy perspective. 
But when you work on the ground in contexts like the Sahel, where um, you know over 80% of people depend on, on rain-fed agriculture uh, or pastoralism for their subsistence, um, when humanitarian assistance has been responding to chronic food insecurity for years, sometimes decades, where we know that chronic food insecurity is driven uh, largely by the loss of ecosystem health um, and the loss of natural capital. And when humanitarian um, action overlaps with extreme vulnerability to climate change and increasingly has to respond to natural disaster, which are linked to, to the loss of ecosystem resilience, this dichotomy really ceases to exist. Uh, and the link between nature and, and food and human security is, uh, is very clear and evident. Um, it's very clear that ecosystem health underpins people's capacity to survive and, and live dignified lives in this context. So for myself and colleagues across the, the FCDO network uh, at the country level, nature-based solutions are increasingly seen as a, as a relevant approach to respond both to short-term security, food security needs, and to build um, a sort of longer-term resilience. Um, so what do we do? Um, again, very emerging, but a couple of examples. So in the Sahel, um, we started by mainstreaming nature positive outcomes through our existing work. Um, so around sort of three main areas. The first one is um, in our work on conflict prevention and peace building. So we integrate into our work on, on mediation and land governance activities that support ecosystem restoration so that communities can increase the natural capital that they often compete for. Um, secondly, we try to mainstream uh, nature positive outcomes in our investment in social protection. We know that nature based solutions are often labor intensive and that raises questions for us around how we deploy them in humanitarian contexts. So we try to identify opportunities to link social protection systems with um, approaches like food for asset or cash for asset approaches, for example. And increasingly trying to mainstream nature positive outcomes in our humanitarian work. So we look at where existing humanitarian programs can integrate ecosystem based approaches, uh, for example, watershed restoration that can improve disaster risk um, uh, reduction or food security and resilience. Now, we're not reinventing the wheel um, in any of these. Um, all the approaches that we're supporting are, are uh, sort of indigenous dryland soil and water management, and we're only here to find opportunities to enable them in humanitarian contexts. Um, we also have colleagues in Somalia that are increasingly looking at nature-based solutions to help mitigate cycles of uh, floods and droughts by using hybrid nature-based solutions, such as uh, whales for flood control, um, combined with sand dunes and agroforestry um, that can help with groundwater recharge. So again, it's very much country-led, but we, we think that these uh, country-led approaches are increasingly carving space for nature-based solution to have uh, more visibility in UK strategies, uh, which in turn will open opportunities for us to do more. As you mentioned, um, the, the COP28 led to the um, adoption of the, the Declaration on Climate Relief, Recovery and Peace. The UK has signed the, the declaration and we're now looking at how to operationalize it. For us, that includes um, a new fund that uh, will be launched in the next few months. This is a resilience and adaptation fund which commits to spend 500 um, million pounds over the next five years to build climate resilience specifically in humanitarian contexts. Um, and we made sure that nature-based solutions were one of the key pillars um, of this work. And this is important for us because this is really the UK's innovation fund for building resilience in the humanitarian context. And so we're hoping that um, having NBS in there, we help capitalize on the lessons learned um, and increase the profile of, of NBS uh, potential uh, in this context across, across different places where we work. Um, another opportunity that I, I see in this space is the fact that humanitarian actors are increasingly working um, uh, in, in places where climate and nature um, are one of the, the driving um, factors behind displacement, uh, conflict and food insecurity, and increasingly looking at ways that they can, um, they can tackle these issues um, in the absence of others um, and, and development actors. And there's also an amazing emerging community of practice, which, um, you know, um, uh, you have all been, been part of building and in, in very useful guides and tools. Um, and, you know, maybe to mention that for me, for example, personally, as a climate advisor, the Sphere Guide has, um, has sort of given me a, a tool to open conversations with humanitarian colleagues on the relevance of nature-based solutions 
um, in in context of um, in humanitarian context. It has sort of put weight and, and legitimacy behind my efforts. Um, so we we see a lot of um, of potential to do more in this space and help shape the the UK strategies and policies um, at the intersection of of humanitarian um, assistance and uh, climate and nature. Um, and maybe to, to come to your question around um, examples of, um, of sort of regional initiatives that that we are involved with, you know, directly or indirectly at this stage. Um, I would say that, you know, there's, first of all, in the Sahel, nature-based solutions are, are not new, right? People have navigated climate variability in dryland for, for many decades, and they've developed indigenous approaches to, to soil and water conservation. Um, many of them have been deployed uh, within the, the Great Green Wall perimeter, for example, but um, we still don't see many that are um, really um, sort of taking place in humanitarian context. Um, even though the knowledge and the tools are already there. So maybe to give you um, two very quick examples, uh, one of them is the ICRC's work in Niger uh, called Eco Resilience. Um, so in, in places where conflict is forcing both host and displaced communities together uh, in areas with scarce resources, ICRC is des designing sort of irrigation, agroforestry and agropastoralism programs that can help them strengthen um, their livelihoods and reverse environmental degradation. So this is a very good example of NBAs being deployed in conflict contexts where um, other actors struggle to access um, and where this, this link with the peace building and environmental peace building um, uh, efforts is, is made through partnerships. So ICRC will partner with the peace building organization to make sure that its action is conflict sensitive. And the other um, uh, uh, regional initiative that is, is um, very uh, interesting in the region is the one led by WFP. Um, it, this is their integrated resilience program, where it really the entry point is really this recognition that, um, that food security is largely led by, uh, by land degradation and, and ecosystem degradation. And so they take a holistic approach to, uh, to resilience by starting by restoring land and watersheds to improve production and water access but also linking that to local value chain and, and strengthening local food systems. Um, and, and here, what is interesting in the use of um, approaches like food for assets uh, to support both short-term uh, and immediate food uh, security while building uh, long-term resilience. Um, I'll stop there because uh, I think I've, I've spoken too much, but do, just to give you a couple of examples. Thanks. Thanks so much, Man, and really interesting. I thought you brought a diverse set of examples from different contexts. I also really liked what you were saying very practically, whether we're looking at conflict prevention, social protection, humanitarian work at large, that it can be many solutions that exist and you can bring in, whether we're looking at sustainable agriculture, reforestation, watershed restoration, etc. cetera. Um, and, and those can be merged in a sense, those approaches that have traditionally been seen apart. Um, and really great to hear that um, there's so much focus on uh, within the FCDO and really integrating this also into your existing portfolio. Um, so it's not always about just building something new, but bringing it into what we're already doing and that that is possible. We don't always have to start with redesigning new NBS programs. Um, building on that thought, Veronica, could you share some of your experiences as well that, that IUCN has had and what does it look like in, in practice? Yeah, thank you, Nini. I have to say, like all the uh, different case studies projects that have been presented, so IUCN, we are working uh, kind of really same project, but we are calling differently. Mm -hmm. They are nature-based solutions. We don't put them under the humanitarian lenses, but for us, it's sustainable land management, land degradation, neutrality, ecosystem-based for disaster risk deduction. So at the end of the day, we are working on the same. We are thinking about the ultimate goal is to safeguard livelihoods, is to ensure that it's co uh, social cohesion, and of course also that we are empowering the communities and that with whom we are working with. So uh, Nature the Solutions is sort of a, a, as a connector, no? To link all the, all the different sectors. So perhaps through Nature the Solutions, we are no longer lost in translation in between humanitarian actors, environmental actors, but we can now build in this new narrative that we are building together. And um, 
maybe also like building on what Mana has been presenting on, on the work of FCDO, uh, IUCN is currently supporting Canada in an effort that they have put in place, uh, so-called the Paneling for Climate. Canada is massively investing on climate adaptation and resilience, and this is under the lessons of Nature Based Solutions. However, if you see what is the ultimate goal of this, um, of this uh, um, big initiative is to support the vulnerable uh, communities in the Sub-Saharan Africa. Here again, we are talking about resilience communities, adapting to climate change and helping advance women's rights and climate adaptation and livelihoods. So if we were talking about a humanitarian project, it will fit perfectly. But here we are working on a climate adaptation lens. End of the day, we are working on the same, but we are going through different channels of implementation. And what is IUCN doing in this type of project? So we are providing uh, oversight and technical support to all the, there are 18 projects under this Partnering for Climate, uh, all over the Sub-Saharan Africa, going from Kenya, Tanzania, Comoros, Madagascar, to all the way to Mauritania, Chad, uh, Cameroon, or really also working on conflict settings. We are working with projects in, Ch in Chad and say like, how can we integrate more prominently uh, nature-based solutions in our conflict discourse and with the communities? And the request is how we do this. So three major pillars. First of all, is to enhance the design and the implementation of MBS. We have the sphere guidance, but if, if you see in the sphere guidance, there are plenty of tools and methodologies. One of them, the IUCN Global Standard, which is coming with different criteria indicators that helps you in really moving into the MBS, uh, in MBS uh, uh, work. And also very important as well is to increase the evidence of biodiversity, climate nexus, and the societal benefits. Again, what we were saying before, nature-based solutions, they are not just nature-oriented intervention, and people-centered uh, actions. We have to work in these mindsets, nature and people. We go hand by hand. We cannot dissociate these linkages. We are a symbiosis. If you talk with many of the indigenous uh, people's community we work with, this is the way of life. This is how we should be all living and embracing nature as part of us. Uh, and then finally, we have the implementation on the ground, but all this incredible work being happening in the, at the local level needs to be leveraged and really to inform the global decisions, international decisions, what is happening at the policy level, what is happening at the regulation, even donor perspective, how are we building new mechanisms that are really building upon what is happening on the ground. So very important also, and here is using IUCN power of convener through over more than 1,500 members is to adopt and scale up nature positive and gender responsive actions globally. Super. Thank you so much. And for summarizing, what are what are the things we should be looking at and doing? And indeed, that we might be talking in different languages, but we're actually talking about the same objective and the same vision. Um, we're coming towards the top of the hour. I'm just grabbing uh, our colleagues who have given a couple of questions we're getting um, from the online panel of the online participants. Um, so here's a question, and in particular, I think to, to you, Mana, but also to others. Um, so that we have already experiences in nature-based solutions. This comes from the UNHCR, who's, who's been looking at this in Mauritania. How do we practically systematize these solutions? They've been around for years, but now there's such an urgency that it's no more something ad hoc, but how do you actually make it like, not a nice to have, but a must have, I guess. Um, any thoughts on that, Mana? And I think it's um, a question that could resonate with others as well, and I know Erica, we were already touching base on that. So maybe Mana and Erica from, from you both, thoughts. Sure, thank you. Happy to start on this one. Um, so I think for me, the, the challenge um, of systematizing is, is how do you sort of go at scale while keeping the, the quality um, and sustainability of this work? Um, and so I think what I've been finding um, sort of interesting approaches is by really focusing on areas where the needs are greatest, but then taking a, a sort of integrated landscape approach where you not only um, look at the physical landscape, because a lot of nature-based solutions are 
uh, need to take place at the, at the watershed level, for example, but also um, a, a landscape approach in terms of the, the different actors that you will involve to ensure that this is um, a, an approach that is understood by everyone and that goes um, beyond silos um, and really uh, creates a sort of holistic approach. Um, and so I think it's important to, first of all, you know, start from uh, communities for them to um, identify what the, the problems are um, and how they want to, to, to start devising solutions, uh, making sure that, you know, um, local government extensions uh, and technical services are involved from the, from the very start. Um, involving local universities, if you can, to make sure that the, the, the sort of expertise on resilience uh, and NBS is, is built in at the local level um, and also brings in that, that, that kind of you know, more modern um, technologies uh, uh, to make it sustainable. Uh, UN agencies, really, I think this idea of convergence in, in particular areas is what proves to be, um, to be leading to, to um, nature-based solutions showing results and showing that they can uh, sort of uh, stand the taste of time. Great, thank you so much for that reflection. A lot of that actually resonates with some of the points we've been learning as well in, in the Red Cross, Red Crescent, exactly about how do we bring this consideration of scale, um, different actors together, how do we combine local and national knowledge in particular, um, whether it's, it's so-called scientific or traditional, and how do we need to break silos to make that happen? Some excellent thoughts there, thank you. Erica, anything you'd like to add? Yes, uh, many, many things, Nini, and many things, Mana, for those uh, perspectives uh, from FCDO, and would really love to have further conversations in some of these areas with, with many of you as, as well. So um, I, I, I do think it's, it's kind of quite interesting um, uh, our, our partners have been and, and, and have been asking this kind of question for years. This is a wonderful idea. We want to do this work. However, we don't necessarily have the access to, you know, international consultants um, to be able to carry this out. We don't have the necessary expertise. I was trained as a food security expert. I was not trained as a climate and environmental expert, et cetera, et cetera. So that whole piece on I want to do this, but I don't know how um, is something that I, I think is, is a wonderful demand, <laughs> wonderful demand. And, and we're so pleased, again, with the signatories to the Climate and Environmental Charter. We know that overwhelmingly our humanitarian practitioner colleagues want to do this work. And I do think we have to come together in terms of looking at various different types of tools, um, looking at these, uh, I don't know, what uh, the, the IT solutions, IT innovation types of solutions. Um, we, uh, we were in the situation, in the position to help uh, co-create uh, this Nexus environmental assessment tool that was originally uh, drawn from uh, the the Norwegian, the NRC, um, that N used to stand for, for Norwegian. Um, and we brought this um, tool as an IT innovation tool that is developed for humanitarians and by humanitarians. It was originally based on the Kobo toolbox uh, framework. There's an Excel version that can be offline. There's a cloud-based version. And we know as data rates, for example, across the African continent get, uh, get lower, e-books and e-transfers of funds, et cetera, et cetera, this idea of bringing in that IT innovation into the work that we're doing in the environmental space, quote unquote, there's an app for that, right? I think that really becomes a critical piece as, as the reporting requirements, et cetera, become complicated. We have to be able to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of that work. Um, I do think we also have to be careful in thinking about how the various different tools, like the, there's the environmental stewardship tool, there's the rapid environmental assessment, there's the Cedric, uh, the, the, the Swiss Cedric approach, et cetera. These tools also have to be interoperable. We have to be referencing each other. We all bring different expertise to the table. Not a single one of us has all of the answers. And so we just learned yesterday of a beautiful tool from UNHCR to choose more green and productive and effective shelter materials. So looking at different tarpaulins from different suppliers and how you bring together shelter experts. And so we have to cross-reference and have these types of tools be interoperable to make this work uh, more easy and, and, and ready for, again, someone that wants to do this work. 
as I've, you've already heard me say, I'm just a dumb physical scientist with my chemistry background, but I have wanted to work in the area of social science. While I will never uh, be a social scientist, as colleagues that I've been privileged to hire are, but I've learned to kind of work in those spaces and to bring that level of respect. So we all can lean in to these spaces in climate and environment and bring the necessary without having to have degrees and, and so on and so forth. And indeed, at the end of the day, those local and simple uh, solutions, as our Indonesian colleague uh, noted, those local and equitable approaches are where a lot of our solutions are going to come from. So well noted on that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Erica, and thank you, everyone. We're coming to the close of the event. Um, I'll just mention a couple of um, closing remarks and then also some follow-up actions from this. So just reiterating, what have we learned today? Um, I think all of you were talking about the importance of having people at the center, locally led, simple solutions, the importance of looking at issues around equity and that we have many of these solutions. We know already the communities uh, most affected by climate and environmental crises know um, how to adjust agricultural practices, how to manage their watersheds, look at reforestation. However, perhaps some of the crises we're facing are so severe that we need to come together. We need to be looking at some new elements of the scale we're working at, the partners we're bringing together, that we're combining different sources of knowledge and expertise with different tools that already exist. So how do we come together around this new, more intense reality that we're all living, um, where climate and environmental crises are increasingly humanitarian crises? We also need to make sure that our solutions are more and more conflict sensitive, that we learn from one another and how to do that. Um, but we have very good momentum. We have, I think, unprecedented donor buy-in, willing to look across traditional humanitarian development climate silos to bring in that nexus space and bring the environment into that nexus space. We have political buy-in through um, issues like the Peace and Relief Declaration um, at the UNFCCC. We have the sphere buy-in to that and indeed the Climate and Environment Charter that most of us in this room as organizations have committed to or as governments uh, are supporting. How do we turn that commitment into action? So I'll end with that uh, and by wishing you all a very happy Red Cross Red Crescent Day, which is today, as some of you will have seen all the buses in Geneva have a two little uh, flags of a Red Cross and the Red Crescent. Um, and I'll end with a little logo we have for ourselves or, or a thing that changing minds is about saving lives. So I think if we change our minds, we bring environment and people to the center, we will be saving lives. Thanks so much, everyone. And yes, indeed, sorry, I'm seeing Veronica turning her thought to me, I've forgotten something. So in particular, those online, but also our colleagues in the room, we have a mentee where we encourage you to give any thoughts you've had from this day, any remaining questions, we'll capture them there. Um, and those of you who are not yet members of the Nature-Based Solutions Friends for Ecosystem-Based Adaptation Working Group, please do come and see us, do become a member, and we'll be picking up this conversation in the June working session of the working group. Thanks, everyone. Ciao, ciao. Stay happy and healthy. And all thank the you so Geneva. much, Mana and Axel online, all our participants online. Thank you for staying with us. Thanks very much. Have a great day, everyone.